evening with a, a quick remark. I just want to say that while we are conscientious objectors to all forms of military service, and partic particularly that's what we're talking about in this series, those actions which have taken place on North Terrace over the last couple of days where crosses of remembrance have been torn up and destroyed, those actions are to be condemned. While we are conscientious objectors, we have no and take no part in acts of vandalism and we do respect and acknowledge those who have given their lives and fallen on the field of battle. So having said that, there was a certain Sunday morning in Beechworth. Leonie and I were getting things organised for the memorial meeting. A young brother, visiting from another ecclesia, came in and was there showing us these massive bruises that he had received from the day before. I asked him how he got these bruises and he said with a big smile on his face that he'd taken part on the uh, previous Saturday in a paintball exercise during the afternoon with friends. Now just as a point, it uh, came up on October the 7th this year. In South Australia, uh, South Australia is cracking down on imitation guns known as gel blasters. These are similar guns as to what's used in paintball exercises. These gel blasters are considered as toys, but they are now being defined by the Australia, uh, South Australian Police as firearms as of the day after the 7th, that is the 8th. Gel blasters are hyper-realistic toys that use a battery or a spring to fire a gel ball made up primarily of water. Now, there is fear that these guns are so powerful somebody being hit by one of these gel balls could actually be killed. There are some 62,000 of these firearms in South Australia. So they either have to be registered as a firearm or surrendered to police. Just an interesting little aside there, but this is the sort of thing that we're dealing with. Now, the one thing I didn't ask this brother was, was it an ecclesial activity or was it just that he was with friends and taking part in this exercise? But I said to him he's just lost his case as a conscientious objector. And in 2 Peter 3 verse 11 we read, Since all these things, that is all these things in the world today, are to be dissolved, what? sort of people or what manner of persons ought we to be in lives of all holiness and godliness. So we need to be very careful on the things that we participate in, particularly um, in our areas of um, games. And of course in a court of law facing an appointed magistrate or judge as a conscientious objector, you will be asked many and varied and sometimes very difficult questions. Now, there's a, a really good book, and it is worthwhile a read, Conscience in Action. It's in our library, and pages 195 through to 199, so there's four, four pages, five pages of questions you may be asked. Now this doesn't, well it does go through a whole lot but there may be other questions that come up and you need to be very careful. This is the magistrate to the young man. You said earlier or implied regarding non-combatant service that Christ taught to do good to all men. Where does he put the limitation? And you have to be able to answer that. What is a Christian. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Prove it. And many of the people about you are Christians. They go to war. 
Why can't you? What makes you so different? Would you be able to remain a, a member of your church if you joined the armed services? Aren't you told to be a soldier of Jesus Christ? And uh, many other questions you'll be asked. Perhaps one of the uh, really nice ones sort of thing is, you see a soldier in the street who is in need of help. Do you bypass him or do you help him? And of course you say, no, well, Jesus has told us we've got to help him. Ah, but tomorrow he is going back to war. That's not my problem. At the moment he needs my help. I will give it to him. And quite often the magistrate or the judge will be quite anti-conscientious objector, even though he's meant to be unbiased. Now this may well be because members in his family have served in the armed forces. Many of them may have been killed. His purpose, however, is to ensure that you are what you claim to be and that you are not just trying to get out of doing what the government may well be asking of you. Are you indeed a bona fide conscientious objector? During World War I, as I mentioned last week, the referendum to bring in national service was defeated on two occasions. However, in World War II, conscription or national service was introduced. Many Christadelphian young men experienced the white feather and the tag coward, self-seeker, that went with it. Imprisonment along with harsh treatment, isolation and ridicule were the elements that had to be patiently borne by each of those who refused to take up arms. Those who have established and are maintaining the right to refuse to kill, to, ki to give future generations a hope. So tonight I want to refer particularly to this book, Conscience in Action, that have been written by members of our community and from their experiences give us an insight into what is involved in being a fair dinkum conscientious objector. And of course, this whole particular issue of being a conscientious objector would be rather pointless me giving it had I not also had some experience at least in the pain and drama of facing a magistrate and undergoing a session in court to put forward my case. And just before going into some of those experiences, I just want to point out that we need to be very, even to the point of being extremely careful about issues such as and the magistrate will say to you, how many meetings are there held each week at your church? And of course, at the time I was before the magistrate, we had the memorial meeting, the evening lecture, we had the Wednesday Bible class, we had, was it once a month, wasn't it, MIC? We had the youth group on a Saturday, all those sorts of things. And how many of those meetings are you involved in how many of those meetings do you go to? Do you do your Bible readings through the week? All of these sorts of questions will come up. You have to be really on your toes. And of course, these sort of questions are again mentioned in this book, Conscience in Action. Another one the magistrate will ask you. And you need to be honest with all of these things. It, it's not that we just have a friendship within our community here at Halifax Street. We have to have a reasonable friendship with those outside. We have to be seen as well-balanced people.
And page 198 in uh, Conscience in Action. Do you participate in any form of organised sport? Do you attend any form of amusement? Do you attend any concerts of music or it, and so on? Do you engage in worldly activities? Do you belong to a union? Now, in this particular one, a, a per certain place I was working at, I told them I was a conscientious objection, uh, objector to a union. Their union hap happened to be the CFMEU. So the boss at the place where I was working, he said, oh, well, Peter, you write your letter and tell them why you're a conscientious objector. And I did, and, he, and the boss comes in, he said, gee, that was like a, a B-52 bomber coming in. I said, well, I just wanted to put down the facts. Anyway, the union rep came to the place of where I was being employed and he came down to me and he said, Peter, he said, I want to meet an, a real conscientious objector. And every time he came to the uh, place, the workplace, he would come and chat with me. We had a really good relationship over the two years that I was there. He would always come to chat and he said he had never seen or met a conscientious objector until me and we got on famously. And I just put that there. CFMEU is one of those unions which is very um, militarised. Is that the word? Militant. Militant. Thanks, Paul. Lovely. What office do you hold in the church? Do you read your Bible often? All of these sorts of things. And the magistrate is trying to develop within his mind whether you are what you claim to be. And on this whole subject, I want to be probably brutally honest. Do you play sport? Now, I've just lost it in this book, but there is a spot where there were two young brothers. Both of them played for a particular football team and both of them regularly went to football and cheering on their particular team and all that sort of thing. And at the end of their session with the magistrate, he said, you're done, guys. You are not fair income conscientious objectors. You participate in all these worldly activities. You go to the football club dinners and all this sort of thing. And they lost their case. They had a very difficult time with their appeal. So, once again, we need to be very, very careful on what sorts of games we play. You play a particular sport or you take part in a particular game, particularly on our phones or on our internets these days. Where do your priorities lie? How often are you on these games? How many hours do you spend doing it? And believe me, they go into these things very, very deeply. Do you play sport outside of your church? And of course there are those games, as I, I mentioned, that you can play on Xbox and on your phones, all these sorts of things. And they are prolifically available over the internet. And most of them are quite violent. Now I, I was speaking to a, um, a sister just recently. I said, you know, I said, there's a, a lot of these games, they, they really are violent. And somebody told me that they played a particular game and when I brought it up on the internet, I said to Leone, wow, they are. You know, it's all about shooting and killing and gaining points. And I said, you need to tell your son to get off those sort of games. They are deadly when you're before a magistrate. And yet we might think that they're quite innocent. Not so when facing the magistrate or the judge or the panel of judges who will determine your case as a conscientious objector. As I said, how many hours do you spend? How many hours do you spend reading your Bible? How many hours do you spend studying? How many hours do you spend on these games you play? And this is how, how much they can affect our lives. Now, when I was in hospital... 
earlier on um, over another little issue. There was a young man brought in oh, around about 11 o'clock at night and put in the bed alongside of me. He had broken his thumb. Now, he was playing a game, one of these real whiz-bang games, and he said he suddenly realised he was losing. And it wasn't until he had actually lost the game he suddenly thought, oh, my thumb's not working. And when the, when the nurse said to him, are you a gamer, she said his heart rate just absolutely went skyrocketed. So this is how much these games can get you in. This young man hadn't even realised he'd broken his thumb. While our young brother going to a paintball activity, or with our young brother going to a paintball activity, the magistrate would quite easily say, OK, so paintball, that's shooting one another, isn't it? You need to win the game. You shoot someone to get a point. OK, now instead of paintball, that is now a bullet. And I tell you what, the difference is you're going to win a lot of points and you're going to win medals by playing this real life game. Do you enjoy shooting? Have you ever killed an animal? If the answer is yes, you have to be honest. How did you feel? The magistrate that I faced had a reputation or a reputation of, or at best, giving the conscientious uh, applicant what is referred to as non-combatant duties. And what makes you, young man, think you're going to be the first? How do you answer a question like that? I can only put my case. And yet once you're in the army, it doesn't matter whether you've got combatant or non-combatant duties. Once you are in the army, you, are, you will fairly quickly learn that first and foremost, you are regarded as a soldier. Even those who were carrying the um, stretchers to go and pick up the wounded had to carry guns. They had to protect the wounded that they picked up and if necessary, be prepared to use that rifle. Now, there was a certain appendix in, or in this conscientious objection, that there was one particular argument in putting young men into as non-combatant. And this is with Robert Menzies. One argument relating to the reason that Australia did not grant full exemption to conscientious objectors as distinct from the practice adopted in England was given by the Prime Minister Robert Menzies. England is in a different position from Australia in this. In England, men are conscripted to fight overseas. Here, they are compelled to train only for home defence. However, as I pointed out last week, the National Service Scheme was introduced by the Menzies government in November of 1964 and that with a, a two-year continuous full-time service in the regular army and to be going overseas. So you just wonder with some of our politicians how they twist the words around. Another experience in Beechworth with a young man, James, appearing on our doorstep one Sunday morning. And James had previously been to the Albury Wodonga meeting, but unfortunately that Sunday they were closed. So the following Sunday he came to our, our place. We fairly quickly learned that he had taken up a carpentry course with the army and was based at Wodonga. There was one Sunday, he'd been coming along for quite a few months, and there was one Sunday where he said that the following Sunday he would have to go out on field activities and so he wouldn't be with us for that weekend. The weekend after that exercise, he again came to the meeting. He was a changed man, very different from the previous week that he, we had met with him. I asked him what was up and he said, um, 
Well, that weekend activity. He learned that particular weekend that he had to know how to use a gun. Not only how to use a gun, but how to dismantle it and put it back together again. And on being handed an automatic rifle and told to shoot at the human dummy at the other end of the field there with the heart, and you aim for the heart, he went to pieces. He put the weapon down and just, he said he stood there, an absolute bath of perspiration, and the sergeant screaming at him. And the sergeant is saying to him, listen, mate, you've just killed or let 50 men die because you won't shoot that enemy down there. And James looked at the sergeant and said, sir, I'm a conscientious objector. And just when did you come to this decision, Sonny Jim? Was he a coward? I think he was pretty brave telling the sergeant there on the battlefield, if you like, that I'm a conscientious objector. Sergeant is intimidating him. Few men, I would say, have shown such courage and bravery on the field of battle. From then on, James was, on the weekends, James was put under the supervision of the camp military chaplain. He was a fellow I would have liked to have met. This chaplain would say to James on the Friday night, Ah, James, he said, I, I want you to do an essay of so many words over the weekend and have it back to me Monday morning, bright and sharp. He said, but in the meantime, I want you to go and be with your friends at Beechworth. They're of more value to you than I could be. It took us six months and $20,000 to get James out of the army and have him registered as a conscientious objector. And James had innocently thought that he could get a really good apprenticeship, and you can, with the army. He wasn't told and he didn't realise that he was considered to be an active soldier in spite of being in a non-combatant role. Over that six-month period, James was treated rather shabbily by those around him, except by the chaplain. Now, in page 183 in this book, Conscience in Action, there's a similar, similar thing that took place with a brother, Colin Park. Colin grew up in a Christadelphian environment. He spent some time in the Methodist Church and chose to enrol for national service in 1965, giving his religion as Methodist. He enrolled on the understanding that he would be involved in non-combatant duties. In September of that year, he applied for exemption from combatant duties, but was prepared to accept non-combatant. He was granted his request. Even though non-combatant was his preferred position, he found that on attending training in Kapuka in New South Wales, he was issued with equipment that included a rifle, which he refused to accept, and he then entered basic military training. Within a few days, he applied for complete exemption. Now, there was a judge, Judge Divine, it says here. Now, how, how fortunate for that. Judge Divine conducted the trial and became convinced that Colin had developed a genuine conscience. He was granted total exemption. The judge concluded that it was not because of cowardice or fear of personal injury that Colin had changed his mind. I am satisfied that the appellant being of the Christadelphian faith did, after entering the service, come to the conscientious belief that upon a true interpretation of the tenets of the faith, he was not allowed to perform any duties at all. What a great judge to be before. In November 1964, the then Prime Minister of Australia, Sir Robert Menzies, 
committed Australia to service in Vietnam by sending advisory personnel to work with the Americans. However, things were really ramped up with the slogan from Harold Holt, the next Prime Minister in 1966, with all the way with LBJ, and con conscription in Australia became like that anecdotal sort of democalis. It was not a lottery that anybody really wanted to win. Not enjoyable having your birth date marbles drawn. However, we had brethren, both here in Adelaide and um, in the suburban ecclesias, Brother Peter Hearn and H.P. Mansfield, who helped those young men with their court appearances. And we're all very grateful for their services in this area. And I, I just wonder whether we really need, need again brethren like that who are able to help our young ones see what could well be coming up in the world in the very near future. The Australian commitment to the Vietnam War, 1965 through to 1972, there was something like 1,012 Australian young men who claimed conscientious objection. Of those, 733 were granted total exemption, 142 granted non-combatant duties and 137 had their applications rejected altogether. Now, page five, Conscience in Action. Fundamentally, the question of participation in defence force activity is the issue of allegiance. To whom do the brothers and sisters of Christ owe their primary allegiance? Is it to the state or is it to God? And we need to decide where our allegiances lie. And it's one thing to be able to show that our history dates back as conscientious objectors to 1864 and the American Civil War, that time when the name Christadelphian was used to facilitate conscientious objection during that war. We today need to be able to satisfactorily show that we are committed, and I mean committed, to that course of action by the way we have lived. We need to be able to determine that our reasoning is based on an understanding of scripture. And not just an understanding of it, but that our conviction, our life, is governed by our understanding. And of course, throughout the questioning before the magistrate or the judge, there are so many scriptural references which directly help our cause. We need to be able to face, uh, sorry, we need to be able to convince those we face that we certainly live by a code of conduct that does not permit us, absolutely does not permit us to take another human life. Now, of course, if we go and kill someone out in the street, we're convicted of murder. It's no different being in the army. That is just wholesale slaughter. But apparently you're allowed to do that, not kill someone on the street. However, it's probably my sense of humour, I guess. With the drama of facing a court, there will be some lighter moments. And I remember one particular incident where we're going on the lunch break and the magistrate said to me, Peter, I could actually have you put up against a wall and shot as a traitor. Now, I want you to think about that over lunch break. And over the, when we went back, one o'clock, we're back at court, magistrate said, so, Peter, have you thought about what I said? And I'm thinking, well, what can I say? Well, 
because going through my brain is great because if I'm shot as a traitor, I'm not going to Vietnam. I've won. But you can't say that to the judge. So I said to the judge, well, that's your prerogative to have me shot as a traitor. But before my God and my Lord Jesus, I cannot join the armed forces. So let us just take a quick look at um, some of the experiences of brothers who have written books and put their experiences down for us to look at. And there was a lovely brother, Len Richardson, a, an Englishman. He wrote the book 60 Years of Christadelphia and a worm's eye view of our community. I had the pleasure of meeting him on one occasion. But um, in his book, 60 Years of Christadelphian, he puts down his experiences. It was in May 1940 that my call-up came. I was still working as an insurance agent for the Prudential Assurance Company. Clients on whom I had to make my weekly calls were not sympathetic to my position as a Christadelphian. One lady with whom I had previously had some conversation on the scriptures and who seemed to be quite impressed when I informed her that I was a conscientious objector and would have to leave my job because uh, the prudential assurance uh, would not accept conscientious objectors uh, to stay on in their um, employ. You coward, you coward, she said, to think that my son's out there fighting for you. There was another brother, another young brother, told the story of his, his first day on a, on a stock farm. His employer was not sympathetic to conscientious objectors and obviously intended to give this young brother a baptism of fire by ordering him to clean out the pen in which his biggest and most fiercest bull was kept. This young brother was no dimwit though. He got a bucket of oats and a short strong stick. By holding the oats outside the pen and the bull had to come over to eat, stuck his head through and this young brother put the uh, peg through the, the bull's ring in the nose and the poor bull's held there for the whole time that this young brother cleaned out the pen. So that was all okay. So there were some rather lighter moments that Brother Len talks about. There's a brother now. I really do have to compose myself on this one. I've tried reading it a couple of times. There's a brother in Nazi Germany. And you reckon we get it tough. Brother Albert Mertz. Brother Albert, uh, the action of Albert Mertz, a Christadelphian under the Nazis in Germany who rejected military service, demonstrates the consistency of the Christadelphian stand across international borders. Albert was not a coward, nor was he a shirker. And he demonstrated this by the fact that he was prepared to die for his conscience. Though accused, though accused of being a shirker, or though accused of being shirkers, his Australian Christadelphian brothers were taking the same stand for the same reasons as Albert. He was jailed at the Landgericht detention prison in Berlin and subsequently sentenced to death. In trying to convince him that he should change his attitude, his own defence counsel. Appointed to, help, uh, appointed to help him, stated, You will remember that the Herr Senate, uh, Senate President read to you the word in the Bible, literally, where it is said that everybody has to be subject to the authorities and that the authorities are instituted by God. If you personally always say that the Bible is competent for you, then you must let pass this Bible word against your conception too. 
you were not able to answer this Bible word in a single word besides. If an authority, as our Führer here, calls upon the German nation to defend itself, if necessary, with the sword, in the fight against assaults of envious neighbours, and if he, if he, as authority, introduced universal compulsory military service, this means, according to the before-mentioned Bible word, an order approved by God, which every subject has to obey. And... It is the firm conviction of me and every German man that our good Lord will be more pleased with a man who gave his life in doing his duty towards his country than with somebody who wastes his life worthlessly only because he cannot change his mind from mere conceitedness. This way of acting can never find the approval of our Lord. Albert was not wasting his life, he was obeying God. His belief was in the kingdom of God. He had no country. He was a pilgrim, a sojourner in Germany. And how could he have fought against his brother Christadelphians if such were in the British or Australian armies? They would not have been his enemy. In any event, he was told by Jesus that he should love his enemies. All Christadelphians have the same view, no matter where they are travelling. On the 23rd of February 1941, he wrote to his family, My beloved all, I find it hard to write to you today, not for my own sake, but rather as I know that this letter will bring you much grief. Therefore, I want to ask you not to take it too hard. You know my faith and my hope. Christ is my life and today is my prophet. And do not cry on account of me, even if I am sentenced to death on the 21st of February. And if I shall be decapitated, then you know that life that has taken shape in me goes back to its source and reshapes in time. When my time has ended and I have to part, I want you to remember that man is destined to die and afterwards to undergo judgment. Tomorrow I shall file a petition for pardon. Perhaps the court will have mercy on me. And if it has not, I still hope to get permission to write to you once again. Include me in your prayers. I want, I want to come to a close now, trusting in God and his kingdom, and send you all my love. Albert was executed on Friday, 4th of April, 1941. Conscience in Action tells us of some who were soldiers and so we do recognise and respect those people. Some who were soldiers and then came to a knowledge of the truth. One such person is Brother Rob Crispin who is mentioned on page 183 and his is a very interesting story of how he from a very young age wanted to be a soldier His earnest desire was to join the military. He was very clear in school that he want, what he wanted to do and was a senior member of the school cadets. At the age of 17, he joined the citizen military forces. He was aware of the Vietnam conflict and had thought of joining the regular army and going overseas to Vietnam, but was too young. And the army was withdrawn before he was of age to go. He eventually applied for a commissioned position in the Australian Regular Army and was accepted as a cadet at the Officer Cadet School. He graduated from there as an officer, involved in an infantry battalion and then a pl platoon. He was later posted as a staff officer to Central Army Records. And so it goes on. And then in October 1982, he became aware of the Christadelphians. And after a little while, he put in a letter of resignation and he wrote, My reason for wishing to resign is that I am now a conscien I am conscientiously opposed to the bearing of arms. 
These grounds are submitted as a result of my recent understanding that the Bible, which I now believe to be the word of God, commands me not to kill. I am committed to obey God rather than man. However, I recognise and remain obedient to the laws enacted by government where these laws do not conflict with the laws of God. And so it was that Rob left the army and became a Christadelphian. In my case, I was a PMG linesman in training at the time of my call-up. I went to tell my boss that I'd been called up and his immediate reaction was, Peter, don't you worry about that. We're going to keep giving you courses for the next few years and you'll just do every one of those so you won't be going into the army. And I said to him, well, I'm a conscientious objector and I'll be going to court. So that was in the February. It was in the May that I had to go to court. It was set for a particular Friday. It was on the Thursday evening as I was getting ready to go home. The boss came up to me and said, Peter, I wish you all the very best for tomorrow. I hope it goes well for you. My son has just gone off to Vietnam. I never found out what happened to his son. And I do wonder to this day what did. And yet I thought, what a wonderful way of a boss to come to a, an underling when his son had gone off to the front. And yet my baptism of fire probably came later in 1967 when working with four other fellows at the Joint American-Australian Space Facility up there in Alice Springs. And as we were having our morning tea, one of the fellows said to me, oh, Peter, you should be in Vietnam, shouldn't you? And I said, well, actually I'm a conscientious objector. I have been to court. Not drinking out of the same water bottle as we drink out of. I said, that's all right, there's five of us and there's four water bags on the truck. So the four of them immediately claimed a water bag each. That meant I didn't have a water bag or that water wasn't available to me. It's probably in moments like that where your faith being tested, you come to a different perspective of things. And I really think that it was God and Jesus with me that day because it was a rather stinking hot February day. So I, I worked through that day without water. The following day I took my own water bottle but the attitude of the fellows was rather interesting. Do you want some water, Peter? <laughs> Not today. I've got my own, thank you. That's fine. There was a sort of an appreciation of me having performed my task without complaining and without lack of water. There's a fellow I'd like to um, actually thank for coming along and being a bit of a support to me in my court case, Brother Clive Wilson. Of course, we'd grown up together in Sunday school. And Clive was there for that day. Clive's dad, Phil Wilson, is actually mentioned in the book as well. So there's, there's a lot of brothers who are mentioned there who give their experiences. Clive's dad was actually uh, given a bit of a rough time by his workmates and at one point knocked unconscious. It was an observation from Clive regarding my case. And he was saying that late into the afternoon it was still not clear which way the magistrate was going to go or how I was faring. My dad was the last one called as a character witness I don't know what, what it was, but poor old dad in the witness box collapsed. And I was at a desk with, with a glass of water, so I got up from, my, from the desk with my glass of water and the magistrate saying, young man, sit down, sit down. 
And I don't remember saying anything at that time, but I went up to Dad, I had a quiet word with him and left him with my glass of water. I went back and sat down quietly. And Clive said that from that moment on, the whole demeanour of the court proceedings changed. And at six o'clock that night, it was one of the greatest feelings I've ever had to have the magistrate read out his declaration that he found me to be a genuine and bona fide conscientious objector. Now, the Vietnam War was a very unpopular war. Many young men, draftees, burnt their call-up papers. Many of them were jailed because of that. There were many protests. Perhaps they were meant to be peaceful, but I can't remember one, a single one being peaceful. They were all geared up for violence. And perhaps Brother Clive, if we've got time, might like to tell you what happened to him on one Friday afternoon after he left university. It was rather strange. The concept of being drafted or conscripted into the armed forces. One had to be of a high moral character to go off overseas to be prepared to shoot, kill, maim, bomb, destroy and generally be totally ruthless in carrying out your duties as a soldier. But these sort of things you can't bring up in the court. And of course there were all those protest songs and particularly one with Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie bringing that particular point out. And yet where in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ do we see such a concept? Do good to your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully abuse you. Turn the other cheek. Treat your enemy well. Do not return evil for evil. And as I read out last week, Joel chapter 3 depicts a time where the nations will be stirred up and the mighty men consecrated for war. And yet, in the First epistle of Peter in chapter 3. Verses 13 through to 18. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for, that, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And just in conclusion, from Conscience in Action, Page 225. Conclusion, the future. Countries allowing conscien conscientious objection require an applicant seeking exemption from military service to demonstrate a faith that is consistent and personal. It is not enough to know the facts about scriptural teaching. We have to live the principles that underpin the, those facts. How could we argue we have no interest in this world and seek a better one to come if we are totally immersed in the ways of this world? During the Second World War, some brothers were denied exemption because they were in the habit of going to the cinema or to the football. 
judges reasoned that if they really repudiated the world and its institutions and looked for another kingdom to come, then they would not amuse themselves with the things that belong to this society. As a result of the legislation introduced in 1992, sisters, as well as brothers, may be conscripted in Australia. There is no longer an issue solely for young men. In Israel today, some Jewish women claim exemption from military service because it would offend their religious conscience to be forced into situations where men and women are close, to close together with limited privacy. They might be granted exemption, but it will be revoked if they are found at a beach or seen shopping in clothes that do not match their stated belief. Will you, young one, especially those, young sister, young brother, in the age bracket of 20 to 40, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, for in this age of equality, the rules apply to both sexes. Are you ready to stand and give an answer for your life's convictions?